up in the meeting proper, uh, and I move that we accept the apologies from Mayor Cull and Councillor Stain, seconded by Councillor Hawkins. Any discussion? Those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against, no, that's agreed. And I'll move that the committee confirm the agenda with the following alteration in respect of Standing Order 2 1 that option C be adopted in relation to moving and seconding and speaking to amendments. Can I have a second, please? Uh, Councillor, <coughs> Councillor Lord, those in favour, please say aye. Against, no. That's agreed. Uh, and I'll remind members of the need to stand aside in respect of the uh, declaration of interest. And I'll, are there any amendments to the declaration or the management regime? I'll move that we note the elected members' interest register. Uh, seconded by Councillor Newell. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against, no. That's agreed, and that we confirm and amend the proposed management plan for elected members' interests. Those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against, no. That's agreed. Part A reports. Ms Pinfold and your team, please. <coughs> Ms Pinfold and Mr Blair, do you have any comments you would like to make about um, the report or are you happy to go straight to questions? Yeah, we're happy to go to questions. Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Just in paragraph 41 uh, around the Cavisham Reserve um, works commencing on site for a proposed barbecue facility, et cetera, um, is, is that the same project that they submitted on during the annual plan process and asked for it to be completed, in which case it is already happening. I'm guessing that's the case. I'm just looking for a signal from Catherine Ward behind me. <laughs> is that the case? I don't know if that, that's, that's, that's helpful to know and that's probably unfair without having access to what the submissions were, but can we, I'm just trying to get a sense of what the overlap between what they asked for and what is happening. We'll follow up. I know that some work is underway, Great. but I'll just have to check at what, what was going Thanks. on. Thank you. Further questions? Councillor Lord. Yeah, um, look, I was just noting the satisfaction for regulatory services on page 17. And I was just wondering, is this purely to do with building consents, or is that mostly building consents? Mm -hmm. I'm just I'm just looking at the um, <coughs> picture on page 17, and I'm, I'm looking at the previous four years, and we've we seem to have had, although the court is down one percent, the overall picture for that is quite significantly improved. So my understanding is that that's, that's both resource consents and building consents lumped yeah. together for regulatory services. So the assumption is that we're either doing something better or people are happier because consents are arriving on time and all sorts. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Councillor Van Der It's been really lovely not to get any building consent complaints for probably a year or so now. But I found that just recently I've had a couple again, and I noticed there's a wee bit of a dip on the uh, resource consent applications on page 18. Mm -hmm. uh, I recognise that you've had uh, an awful lot of them, uh, and that they, they peaked around, what, September or something of, of last year. Um, wondering if the um, consents for both resource and building are under control. Um, and whether the complaints I'm currently getting are just that little glitch that's at the end of the graph, perhaps. Um, if you could give us some idea of, of what we can expect in terms of meeting uh, timeframes. Uh, from a resource consent point of view, the team are fully, are fully stretched, so I'd say it can be described as coping, coping at the moment, but they're, but they're fully stretched. Um, in terms of complaints, you can see that there have been significant um, numbers of complaints over the last year, um, but we've been res we've been we've had additional resourcing to deal with that. So we're working through a lot of uh, well current, but also his historical or complaints that have been on the books for some time. So you think in in both cases, building and um, resource, that that we will look forward to a better year coming 
that you, you're, you've got things in place to deal with it. I can only answer resource consents. Through the Chair, for building consents, um, we did dip slightly below the 100% in the last month, yeah. just for a few days. We're confident of, we're back at 100% and we're confident of that continuing, and we're confident of the next 12 months continuing in, in that vein. Okay, right. Um, you, you might be pleased to hear that they're very quick to complain when you don't get up to that new higher level now, so you've got to stay there, basically. Councillor Elder. Um, just a question, um, resourcing in the future, um, with the, <coughs> the increasing um, building um, happening in Dunedin, um, what are the plans um, regarding staffing around there? As part of the annual plan process, Council did look at um, the resourcing in those areas, and so you have um, increased the, the staff that was available for the consents team. And I think, Adrian, did you get an increase or in your area, an, an increase in both ends of the pipeline? Mm. I'm glad. Councillor Gary. Thank you. A couple of questions. Um, I was just wanting to know item 14 on. Page 19, the new mobility inspection tool went live. Could you tell us about that? I might ask Mr Henderson to come forward and chat to you about that. Uh, through the chair. Um, yeah, we've got a new mobility tool. This is a, I guess, like an iPad type system. Um, which is touch screen, which makes the inspections far more quicker um, and also allows the inspectors to spend more time inspecting than actually doing paperwork and, and writing things. So um, certainly the, the first month has seen record number of inspections completed, which is exciting. So they can do it on site, on the job? Oh, absolutely, yep. Excellent. Yep. Thank you for that. Uh, my next question is around... Um, the Heritage Fund, I don't know who can answer this one. Uh, item 31, page 24. Um, can you just identify the, the property at Pokahiki? Is that the hall at Pokahiki? I'm not yeah, sure it's who the I'm church. looking at. Yeah. It is the church. Yeah. Not the, okay, thank you. And finally, um, 40, page 25, the Urban Design Grants. Um, how do we think that's going to be played out? How, how will that be organised, do you think? Along the lines of the grants that we already have? Uh, yeah, that's right. Following, following the similar, similar principles to the other, the other, um, the other grant setups we have. If you want to talk, talk, ask any further questions, Catherine's here, but yeah, generally it will follow our standard processes. <coughs> Just an, an answer to your question about the historic church. Uh, that's the first we anticipate of a number of um, requests for assistance that will be coming from that trust, but that's to get them started. Further questions anywhere? Okay, I'll move that we note the Planning and Environment Non-Financial Activity Report for the quarter ended the 31st of May, seconded by Councillor Hawkins. Any discussion? Those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against no. That's agreed. That takes us to item six, the food grading policy review. Ms McGill, welcome. Thank you, Chairman. Would you like to make any comment about this report? No, no, thank you. It's all in the report. All right. Councillor Lord has the first question. Uh, Rose, I just remember when we last uh, upgraded these about four years ago, there was um, <coughs> concern about how that was going to be applied and particularly um, people making cheese rolls and <laughs> selling cream puffs at uh, school fairs and all that sort of thing. I've read through the policy and it appears to be only people that have to be registered as selling food. So can I just take from that that there will be no change to the status quo for the likes of people making cheese rolls and running barbecues at the warehouse and that sort of thing? Yes, through the Chair, um, the Food Act um, exempts those um, activities from our jurisdiction, so we, there'll be no change. So, so the new Act does? And under the previous Act, was that different? Yes, it was. Yep. Yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you. The dairy industry won't be threatened by changes in the production of cheese rolls. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Garrett. Um, thank you, Ms McGill. I just wanted to... I noticed the numbers for A-grade 
which are really high, actually, really, and none in degrade. How do we compare with other cities in relation to that? I was pleasantly surprised at um, how those the spread. Um, each city has their own way of managing um, their grading system. Not there is only a limited number of cities that have grading systems. So, but they're not apple for apple. The uh, Food Act itself is looking at at some point bringing in a national grading system. But um, as you can imagine, trying to make that um, consistent across the country is going to be quite difficult. So they're working through that at the moment. But our our system um, works well, and I think since the new Food Act came in, we're seeing a constant, steady good response from the food operators, taking responsibility for their own management of the food safety. So your view would then be that this is a very positive number? Absolutely. Further questions anywhere? There appear to be none. Um, I'll move that we, uh, that we adopt <coughs> the upgraded food grading policy 2019, seconded by Councillor Lord. Any comment? Those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against, no. That's agreed. Um, thanks, Ms McGill. <clears throat> Which takes us to item seven. Mr McLeod, if you'd like to come up, and Mr Henderson, the DCC submission on the Building System Legislative Reform Programme. <clears throat> Neil, do you want, does either of you want to make some comment about this or before we go to questions? Uh, I don't believe so, Mr Chairman. I'm uh, very happy to take any questions. OK. Questions, councillors? Councillor Wiley. Um, Neil, am I taking it that um, this has gone out for a full submission, so the building industry and everybody else around the country are submitting on this, or have the opportunity to submit on this? I, I believe so, Mr Chairman. Um, MB appear to have consulted very widely on this issue. Certainly they've consulted all of the building consent authorities, uh, all of the building industry groups, including architects, engineers, and I'm assuming um, you can make a submission as a taxpayer. OK, perfect. Um, then follow up to that, I noted um, there was one part of it, sorry, just was a, uh, the first item in the letter was around the building products and methods and something that I've noted over the last period of time. Everything that comes into New Zealand has to be certified to New Zealand standards. Do they not Oh, if only that were true. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm afraid not, no. There's virtually no limitation on building products imported into New Zealand. The, usually the first check on the process to see whether that product may or may not comply with the building code is when a building consent application is made. So something coming into New Zealand that's got a European, past European standards or North American standards or Australian standards? Uh, can automatically be used in construction in New Zealand? Automatically, probably not, although some of those standards are a direct comparison to existing and applicable New Zealand standards. Generally speaking, those products, if they're made to an overseas standard, would be assessed as an alternative solution by the Building Consent Authority. But many of those North American and Europe European standards, and Australian standards for that matter, um, are accepted quite readily within New Zealand. OK. So do you think this what's been submitted on here is a step in the right direction or a step in the wrong direction or a neutral response? I think it's a step in the right direction, but I think we will need to go a great deal further if any meaningful progress is to be made. You will note throughout the submission that I talk about these things working, but only if they prove compliance with the New Zealand Building Code. Uh, just talking about products and systems, the big problem that the entire building consenting industry faces is that we are constantly <coughs> presented with a product or a system that doesn't clearly demonstrate how it complies with the New Zealand Building Code. And the building consent authorities are often left in the unenviable situation of having to work it out for themselves. And it's often that issue that takes so long to get a building consent granted. 
because the applicant for the building consent, their suppliers, their manufacturers, don't clearly understand the way the New Zealand consenting system works. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gary. Thank you. Um, I'm thinking in particular, focusing on page 49 um, in its paragraph eight around climate change. Um, and I just wondered what your view was uh, on the following. So uh, at, at the moment, under the Building Act, there's certain things that um, have to happen. Um, and they aren't necessarily in sync with the imperative to address climate change. Um, and do you think that this submission goes far enough in terms of trying to marry those matters up? Where we require certain things that are really no longer appropriate um, as we look forward to addressing climate change yet mitigation reduction. And it might be the requirement to asphalt an area, for example, or deal with stormwater or whatever it might be off a property when they're applying for a building consent. Yeah, I'm actually going to duck for cover on that, and I'm going to actually ask Jessie to come and speak to that one. Are you able to speak to that, Jessie? It might be that you don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I, I, I'm afraid it, it's yeah. not the part, a part of the submission that I personally drafted, so <clears throat> I'm afraid I really about, can't comment. How about if um, perhaps you pass on a response in due course? Perhaps it's something we could, we could do some research with That's and come fine. back to you. Thank yep, you. that would be good. Councillor Wilson. Thank you. I, I didn't... I certainly <coughs> wouldn't ever claim to know lots about this area, so I may be asking a dumb question, but... One of the biggest issues, and we hear it in um, solid waste all the time, is actually the, what, the end product and the product stewardship of um, building pro supplies um, and understanding that. And it, I couldn't see anything in here that necessarily asked that question. But one of the biggest issues is what do you do with a product when it's part past its use by date in a building or bit demol in demolition? Mm -hmm. um, they're not always good things to put into the landfill. Um, and... I don't think that was covered in the submission questions, but whether it's something we should be covering off, because um, if a product doesn't go in the landfill, then what does happen to it? Or even some of the timber that we're using now with the chemicals in them, um, they're hard to dispose of in the right way. Mm -hmm. um, should that be an area we should be submitting on, or have I missed something? Uh, Mr Chairman, the, the, the consultation was five relatively narrow areas. Uh, I attended a, two MB uh, sessions in Wellington on this, and it became clear from that that this is really just the start of MB looking at some of these issues. It is my understanding that there will be further consultation around a number of other issues, just where recycling or sustainability may fall in the, the MB submissions or, or the MB consultation, I really don't know. Um, I, I agree yeah. at, the, at, at this stage the Act probably doesn't do a great deal for recycling buildings that have reached their use by date. Uh, appreciating, and so basically it isn't in there and therefore they haven't asked the question, um, would, it's a chicken and egg thing, if we don't highlight that at the start we're going to continue to get products that are coming in that are going to cause issues potentially. Um, and it, it, it seems to me that if we don't start looking at the end product or the end um, a, a, at an early stage, would it be inappropriate to add in the letter that's attached that, there, that we think that product stewardship issues should be dealt with at the front at, as one of the next MV matters to be considered? Um, if, if that is what... Uh, this meeting requires. Yes, mm. absolutely. Okay. I, I see no reason not to do so. Thank you. Well, it's quite clear what you're asking, Councillor. Is the general agreement around the table that it would be appropriate to draft a generic passage about that issue and include that in the submission? There appears to be nothing but nodding heads. Mr Pickford. Because Green Star looks at the whole life cycle of the building, as I understand it, and it doesn't look at the environmental impact. Okay. 
So, but you could add something to, to that, that part of the submission. But as Neil said, it is a little bit outside of what you are asking, but that's why we did include Green Star to address those kind of concerns about the environment and the fact that building the right. whole life cycle. Okay, so councillors are quite happy if we just leave it on that basis. This kind of the, the, the submission is going to be slightly altered to, to stress this point that Councillor Wilson's raised. That's good. Further questions? Councillor Elder. I know it was um, new technology um, and um, new, we've got the ability to produce a whole range of new products. Um, and compliance to New Zealand building standards is important. Where, where do you think this should happen and who should be responsible for that in the process of um, getting products into New Zealand or even in New Zealand? Well, my, my understanding at the moment is we have a relatively free economy and that anyone is able to import pretty much whatever they want into the country. On that basis, I believe it is the government that should regulate that if it is needed. My personal view is that we're getting a lot of products imported into the country that, quite frankly, are not worth having. We, we struggle hugely to try and work out how or even if they might comply with the building code. And don't lose sight of the fact that the building code is the minimum standard, so you're only looking to make things comply with a, a relatively low standard. So, so I believe in answer to your question, it should be the government. Thank so you. As, 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 things, as new products come in, that, that they should be vetted at some point? You couldn't import a car into the country second hand without having it be checked to comply with our road rules. Thank Council, you. Councillor Lord. Yeah, just um, following <laughs> up from that question, Neil, so, so the likes of the product that you're referring to, I assume you're not talking about great big retailers bringing in um, huge amounts of product, but is it more guys like myself going and going to China and picking up two, two pallet loads or two uh, containerfuls of some alternative jib product or something? Mm -hmm. What's, what sort of products are you perhaps referring we, we to? We are finding all sorts of things, uh, everything from... Um, uh, um, external wall claddings that purport to be something from Europe when in fact they're made in Asia uh, with completely false certification. We're finding um, entire shower units imported into the country which uh, look great, um, lit up like a Christmas tree, looks like the cockpit of a 737 but the plumbing fittings on the back look like their garden hose. And when we ask the question, how does, this, how does the glazing comply, they look at you blankly and will simply say, well, what labels would you like on them? So um, it, it's really the whole gambit of materials up, up to products. and including completed buildings. Yeah, And would that include insulation products as well? That are Absolutely, yeah. yes. And, and often, often they look like something else, and you you have a devil of a job trying to work out what you're looking at. Mm. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Further questions anywhere? <laughs> Councillor Lord, you're moving. Absolutely. Yeah. Seconded by Councillor Hall. Any further discussion? Those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against no. That's agreed. Thank you. <coughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. McLeod. Uh, Ms. Ward. <coughs> Item 8, colleagues, the Central City Plan Retail Quarter George Street concept design. <laughs> Councillor Newell has already indicated he wishes to move, given his positive comments. Um, can I begin by thanking um, you two again publicly? Sorry, uh, Mr. Saunders and Ms. Ward, uh, for uh, the work you've done in terms of the, pub the very successful community consultation and discussions around this issue. Um, uh, I'm assuming that they will continue after this um, plan is concept plan is approved or not. Um, and I have to um, I have to also remark that uh, the very positive feedback that's come from the local media. 
in, in response to their poll and so on of what people have seen of these uh, proposals um, is very um, heartwarming, I suppose. Um, so now you are going to run a short presentation for us, is that correct? Uh, after which time we will have plenty of time for questions of you two before we move to the report. Councillor Hawkins, right? You are, you are the first question in due course. The floor is yours. Right. I'll you can have the I'll screens as well. About to see it now. Um, Thanks, uh, Councillor. So what, what we thought we would do today is just run through uh, a little bit of the uh, information that was uh, presented during in the engagement, uh, some of the thinking of the project team uh, that's led us to the concept designs that are included within the report. Uh, it will hopefully just give a bit more context than what we could put on paper, uh, and then obviously happy to answer any questions uh, about that. It was a certainly a significant engagement process led by Catherine um, and a number of members of the uh, project team did a fantastic job um, getting out and soliciting engagement from different um, parts of the community, making sure everyone was given a chance to have their say. Uh, certainly the, the best one I've been involved in um, with the various projects we've run to date, which was great. So we'll um, move on. So, um, so here's just a recap of what's been happening and where we are in the process at the moment. So um, let's start with the past. Don't like to live in the past, but hey. Um, the Central City Plan was adopted by Council in 2011. There was then significant upgrades um, to the warehouse precinct. Um, and then obviously in a long-term plan, the Central City Plan transformational projects were committed with $60 million worth of funding. Then in April 2018, Council adopted the Global Street Design Guide. So the Global Street Design Guide is adopted and put together by um, 72 experts from all over the world in over 40 countries, all come together to put a document together that identifies good universal and urban design best practice. So Council adopted that document. It's also adopted in um, Auckland in New Zealand and um, thankfully for me also in the UK. Um, then obviously, as Richard said, we've completed an extensive um, 10-week consultation with stakeholders. So that included over 25 workshops, um, nearly 50 roadshows, social interactive mapping, surveys, and lots of other information that was reported back to P&E on the 16th of April. Um, and there's a, a little bit of flavor of a recap of what that is in a moment, and then where we are at the moment. So today we're going to be presenting a preliminary concept design. It gives us a look and feel and our initial thoughts about layout how that fits in our wider transport network, um, as well as really good urban design, good practice. Yep. So um, in terms of informing the concept design, obviously we, um, we had significant community engagement, but um, before that we've got strategic directions set out in the central city plan, um, which, are, which are listed there. So they, these are the things along with the global street design guide that, that underpin uh, any, any designs um, that we that, that have subsequently been developed. So a, a livable city, environment sustainable, resilient, enables prosperous and diverse economy, accessible and connected city, vibrant, exciting and memorable, distinctive city. So quite, quite broad, but important to remember that that um, central city plan document that's been endorsed is what we should be using to guide the individual projects within, um, within the central city um, redevelopment as well. One thing we do know from the community engagement is that there is a, um, there is a mandate for change. When that question was asked, um, and we reported this back in our previous report, uh, and I don't have the exact numbers, but a significant majority of people were seeking a change of some sort, which varied from full pedestrianisation to changes to improve the pedestrian space. Uh, there were an, an, uh, a number that uh, wanted no change, and that, that's uh, common across our engagements. That, that's a, um, obviously a view we get through most of our projects. So the, the mandate was there through the engagement, and we've tried to translate these objectives um, and the ob objectives specific to the retail quarter uh, into that design. Um, so that's another thing to note is of those strategic directions that Richard just alluded to, there are also councils will understand the strategic objectives of the spatial plan as well. 
Um, from, a, from a retail quarter perspective, councillors have in attachment B the strengths and weaknesses of the retail quarter, which are identified and specified in the um, central city plan. But just a flavour of what those say and, and ways in which we've responded. That includes obviously incorporating our three waters underground infrastructure in any improvement, the changing retail patterns of, of the world and Dunedin also, conflicting ideas on space and how priority and how space should be allocated, um, limited amounts of public open space and creating an accessible city. There's quite a few on the list, so I'll just give you a flavor. Um, but just as a, um, a breakdown, really, um, and a recap. So in the 16th of April Plan and Environment Committee report, I just lit, lit the room up, um, the, um, and in attachment A of the, um, the report package is the individual breakdown of what that feedback said, but here we've, we've surmised it and summarized it and put it all together. So what it says on the top left is our comments around layout. So as Richard said, the status quo is the top, um, the top bar of the top left graph, at all going all the way through to incremental change to full pedestrianization of all blocks at the bottom of the graph. Um, there's obviously comments there on, on movement, accessibility, connectivity, um, the use of um, delivery vehicles, accessing George Street, as well as operational functions. Um, it says on the bottom left graph that more, um, got quite high numbers and the largest of the, on that graph is less traffic on George Street. Um, and then the remaining three graphs, um, top, middle top, and the other ones include um, how the community uh, feel that can change from a placemaking perspective. So that includes more greenery, more seating, street art and artistic interventions, events, eateries on the street, access to laneways um, and accessibility. And then the bottom right is, um, is comments around car parking. So you can see there that people wanting more car parking and it also goes into car parking buildings, um, less on street car parking um, and park and ride and then other unspecified car parking comments. So of all this information altogether, this was 1,198 individual submissions. Um, so there is a mandate for change, as Richard said. So some of the challenges um, following consultation that we've considered obviously has taken um, the movement and how the street is functioning at the moment. So that includes safety and accessibility, uh, planning considerations. We know from on, um, on, on, ongoing consultation with the Access for All Forum, it's perceived that George Street's actually not very accessible. It's very difficult for people with all different um, needs and vulnerable members of our society to access the street. But also it, that accessibility could be about our cultural backgrounds and diversity and how that's represented in the street and all cultural identities of George Street. Each of these blocks of George Street is completely different. It has different characters. Some, some of the street is serviced from the front. Some of the, of the buildings are serviced from the rear of, of George Street. Um, there is a mixed use of retail, and each of the blocks has an incremental um, mixed use, including food um, and eateries and other options. Um, if we followed our consultation that the public have requested, um, removing or significantly reducing traffic on George Street would incur other supplementary works that would need to be um, completed, whether that's to Fallall Street, Gate, Great King Street, and those east-west movements of St. Of St Andrew, Hanover, Frederick, and Moray Place. So this consideration for the wider transport network. There's obviously changing modes of transport and, and where conflicts have arisen, where those are, are located in different parts of the street. The, the, there's a number of uh, buildings in the street, some of which are in better condition than others, some of which are earthquake strength and some aren't. There's obviously uh, verandas and all of those, bar a few, are actually in private ownership. Um, George Street is currently used uh, as a through route um, and less as a destination retail uh, space. Um, as we've said earlier, there's limited public space. The only real um, open space on George Street is the green space associated with Knox Church. Um, the climatic conditions, the farmer's side of the street is the sunnier side of the street, although the, um, the opposite side does get some sun, but there's also obviously a wintry wind that blows down the street as well. So those climatic conditions need to be taken into consideration and where height of buildings create shade. Um, yeah, there's conflicting ideas about space and priority and a perception of, of what that should be. 
and a perception of, of the provision of car parking. Um, some of these we have dealt with um, in the concept design and some of it will take forward. And obviously we have an emerging cultural narrative that we've been developing along with Manafenua, which I will talk about as well in a minute. I will let Richard speak at some point. <laughs> So um, just as a reminder to councillors about what our design principles were, and these are in keeping with the central city plan objectives. So the first of that is putting people first. We're a pretty walkable city to a certain extent on the flat, and some of the feedback from the community through the consultation showed that quite a number of people are walking around our CBD, um, whether they're using a mode to drive into it and walking from their car, um, or using various modes as people walking down to work every day. Um, walking is a thing. Um, we know from um, developing a, a thriving retail quarter that um, having some form of pedestrian improvement of the, of the space is, is going to boost the economy. Um, creating meeting and resting points, there's very little seating throughout George Street and that's part of our accessibility issues. Um, this, the, the pedestrian elements of the street are used as a very much an A to B linear, linear function at the moment. Um, so we need to put people first. And I actually have a quote from a piece of work that's been completed um, in, in Wellington at the moment on Golden Mile. And um, a representative of Retail First Organization for Retailers, their MD, um, has put a quote today saying, greater walkability and fewer cars make for successful commercial environments where people visit more frequently, spend money, and advocate for. So I think putting people first is something um, is a good design principle to take forward. Creating an otipoti de Neden sense of place. This means something different to, um, to everybody who lives in Dunedin. Um, for me, it's celebrating what's special about Dunedin. The interesting things that have taken place here pre-1840, post-1840, and in every decade since, including Dunedin's popular culture, um, reflecting Dunedin's past and developing its future. It's important to look back before you look forward. Um, and celebrating our culture, our heritage and character and creating an inclusive place where we can all be together. Green in the city. So this is about um, the benefits that greenery and vegetation provide not only to the natural world, but to us personally from a mental health and physical health perspective. But also the more greenery um, there is, the more uh, adapted we will be to the change in um, climate crisis. Um, by um, creating trees, creating shade, but also the role of um, rain gardens, sustainable urban drainage, and the role that takes in reducing f um, future flooding events um, in George Street. Um, it's a really important item. And actually, in the submissions we've had through the engagement, Greenery got some of the biggest comments of all of the items uh, put together. And this idea that George Street is a place, it's a destination, it's not, a, but it shouldn't be a place if it's a thriving, uh, thriving heart of our city, a place that we just, just drive through. It should be a place where people can come together, where we can celebrate events and community activities, where we encourage people to stay and we create that inclusive environment. So we've been having ongoing conversations with our stakeholders uh, since we reported the uh, evaluation of the um, consultation to Planning Environment Committee. Um, one of those meetings obviously has been with Manafenua as our key partner in the city. Um, so um, I presented the, the draft concept for, for tweaking along with Casino Doyle, who's a member of our project team and a planning member of the Orkaha planning team. Um, and that was a really great experience. And, and immediately at that session, uh, loads of ideas came from Manafenua about celebrating cultural identity. So the beginning of the concept that we would present to council here is a way that we can work together with Manafenua to celebrate the heart of our city. The, 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 the heart thread that George Street is to the whole of our city, the, the place that people uh, come together, where we celebrate not only um, iwi, but also we celebrate all cultural identities um, and, and we represent the whole heritage of the city. Ready? Here we go. So of all that information then, um, following that, 
following these meetings, we've been sitting together in a multidisciplinary team across council, made up of obviously urban designers, transport engineers, transport safety engineers, heritage, our artistic um, colleagues in Aratoy, uh, with Man of Fenua, and with, gosh, there's probably more, our parks and reserves uh, colleagues and our arborists to put together a concept that we feel really works for the city. Um, so these three typologies that you've been presented and were presented in the, um, in the report that you have in front of you are taken directly from the Global Street Design Guide. Um, so they have a shared space, which would be, uh, could be one way or two way, but here is a one way, a commercial street, which is a one way and a slow street environment. The shared space and the slow street environment are the two typologies that we showed throughout the consultation and um, members of the public were very, very comfortable with the idea of shared spaces, hence why some of the feedback from the stakeholders says um, part pedestrianisation. So the shared space on the, on the top left would be for the golden block, and we'll show you what that looks like in a moment, but that it basically doesn't include curb and channel. Um, one of the key things to take into consideration is no matter what happens to the design of the street, we still need a movement corridor for emergency vehicles and for um, deliveries to operate through the space. So that would still need to be evident. Um, the other thing to note here, and I probably should have said it earlier, is that the street becomes less activated after four o'clock. Um, so natural surveillance is a key safety implication um, as we go forward, um, as you know, people use the street, that additional bonus of natural surveillance is required. Um, and then the middle image, obviously, is a one-way street with a contraflow um, for smaller modes. And it includes, obviously, all of these images include increased placemaking. And then the slow street environment is a two-way street with significant placemaking, um, but has traditional curb and channel and formalized crossing points. So what does that look like? So here's some visualization. So uh, very excitedly for the project team, Simon Kahn was very happy to work alongside our visualization specialist to put these together. Um, so we, um, using the concept designs, have just given a feel of what the direction we think we should be going that we would like to present to council. It includes obviously a celebration of um, Orty Porty Dunedin with some historic stone pavements, including uh, Mary Patning. It's got significant eateries, green vegetation. So this, this farmer's block and the new Edinburgh Way block include obviously curb and channel asphalted carriageways. We are proposing a, a, a one-way um, one street from Frederick Street through to Murray um, Place, and we'll look at that on the plan in a moment. You can see there the contraflow. And um, this is using native plants. Yeah. So, and here's a shared space. So a shared space obviously still has a movement corridor, has no curb and channel, it's all on one level. This includes obviously through all blocks, uh, rain gardens and other sustainable urban drainage. Again, native trees, activated spaces um, that is put very accessible. And then a slow street environment. So a slow street environment, which we would propose here for the Knox block, where the Knox church is, is located, is a two-way street. We know that the buses will be running all the way up Great King Street into Frederick Street onto George Street. So really, we need to allow sufficient room for buses to be able to meander down this block. Um, but certainly, um, potentially, a slower street environment. Again, more placemaking. And the amenity aspects in this block could be things like parklets, greeneries, and trees. And then what does that look like? Mm, so as a, as a whole project with the four blocks, we, um, we know, we appreciate, we've got some challenges. We, we know at the moment that George Street is, is a priority northwest route with, with significant traffic counts. When you look at the objectives within the central city plan, the retail quarter, um, the feeling is that that is, that is not um, a good fit with the way George Street currently operates. And the purpose of this plan is to remove some of that traffic from George Street and give more space to pedestrians and other modes of transport and more space to allow green space, uh, eating areas, uh, and um, but still retain a movement function. Now that movement function's been shown from north to south 
Um, there's a few reasons for that. First of all, north to south, we, we don't want to encourage long-term people to use uh, the octagon um, as a way to travel south, north through town. So shifting, shifting people away from the main street at that point. We have capacity on Falul Street and Great King Street. The uh, initial modelling has shown that. It would need some work. Uh, there will need to be some changes to the light phasing and some intersection improvements, but there is capacity on our network to carry those numbers. Uh, it doesn't come without compromise, so I think we need to be clear on that. Uh, but if you look at the objectives and what we're trying to achieve, we can still move tra transport through the network, uh, but we, we give more priority to pedestrians, to other modes of transport, to our vulnerable users on our, on our main retail street. Um, the re one of the other reasons from going, uh, for going from um, north to south in terms of the one-way movement, it allows us to make some significant changes to the five-way intersection. Um, we've got our central city bookended by two five-way intersections, which are incredibly difficult um, in terms of managing both traffic and pedestrian movements safely, uh, and allowing having a, a one-way movement into there effectively allows us to remove one of the green arrow phases which will speed things up and we can also change the way our curbs are built to shorten some of our crossing distances which gives us more uh, options within our uh, pedestrian crossing phases. So those are, those are some of the fundamentals. It, it is important to note that with any change like this there, there, there will be some um, flow and impacts to the way uh, traffic travels around the city. We're comfortable our network can manage it and people will, will adjust to it. Um, we have retained, and we've got a slide a little bit further on around parking. We know that's an issue. It came up again and again in engagement, and it will continue to come up. It's important to the retailers, it's important to people that work in the city, and it's important to people that are visiting the city, shoppers or for whatever other reason. Um, so we can cover that off a little bit further on, but I guess what I would note within the design is there is space within that road corridor for parking on those, on those four blocks. We're not intending to remove all of that space. So that, those are some of the, I guess, the, the overarching features and, and I guess the, from a transport perspective, what we're looking at in terms of network movement um, with some, some further modelling and some design of some of those uh, other intersections. The other thing to note here is um, obviously the community has requested full pedestrianisation. What we're including in, in this proposal is electronic bollards to be fitted in entrance and exit points to certainly the golden block, the shared space that we have, but certainly we consider putting them through other blocks if the budget allows with some through our further traffic modelling. That gives us the flexibility to be able to pedestrianise the space later or for events, for graduation and for other things that might take place. So certainly we, we feel that we've incorporated all of the feedback that we've had through the consultation. But that is a really key aspect, I think, to, um, to support future pedestrianisation um, in, this, in this design. So what does that look like through each of the blocks? So here's the farmer's block. So you can see there is a, uh, the, the black arrow indicates a one-way movement where all, yeah, sorry, that's a good thing to note. The farmer's, that's the title where it says farmer's block. Farmer's is obviously on the southern part of the street. As you can see on the, on the image there, it's at the bottom, not the top. Um, so you can get your bearings. Um, so Moray Place is on the left and St. Andrew Street is the next one, I think. So really you can see there the black arrow indicates um, a single lane which we would need to, to have had anyway through a movement corridor for the operational functionings of the street. Um, obviously in that the blue arrow indicates the, the, the smaller mode contraflow heading north. Um, you can see um, there's an image that shows um, an allocation of car parking, which we haven't allocated to what users, but obviously it would be within our normal hierarchy of users, serving our most vulnerable parts of society first. Um, the dashed line indicates the line of the existing veranda through these drawings, so they can see there's considerable gains made um, in pavement widths, as well as opportunities then when, when trees and greenery can be planted away from the veranda. And um, you can see also there's a, a, a chicane in the street, a kink, the, the movement corridor has got a slight bend in it. That's really, as we travel through the street, an opportunity to dissipate the wind speed that drives up to improve the pedestrian experience. Um, but yes, yeah, so these are our, as we said, um, providing you with um, the spatial characteristics of the street that we would like to take forward. Oh, and the uh, elliptical shapes are indicative locations for rain gardens. We have had some flooding events in George Street, and I'm sure um, we'd all wouldn't like to see that again. 
The other thing to note is obviously we're talking here about an urban design aspect which is above ground. Certainly the design of the three waters infrastructure will connect to what we've put here, but certainly that design will come a little bit later. Um, so here's the golden block. So this is a paved carriageway with no curbs. Um, with no curbs, all on one level. It has a, a drain that runs through the entire street. Again, rain gardens, car parking spaces, the green areas indicate what, what I'm calling amenity zones. Those are spaces where artistic interventions take place, where there's seating, drinking fountains, um, and lots of other exciting place-making elements to the street. And um, they'll be the things that, um, as we go forward, will bring, bring character, but certainly where we can bring our cultural narrative to. Again, a kink in the street, maximizing the sunny side of the street. And then the new Edinburgh Way block, oh, the other thing to know, I forgot, is the golden block obviously will certainly have the electronic bollard. So when the bollards are up, it'll feel like a pedestrianized space. Um, and again here, the new Edinburgh Way box, another uh, commercial one-way street, the south moving of the vehicle, vehicles moving south, allocation for some car parking spaces, AVO delivery drop-offs, as with all the other blocks. Um, amenity areas, place making, drinking fountains, all of that again is evident here. We know this, this, this block is used a lot for food and obviously we'll increase that um, as it goes through to the Knox block, but certainly there'll be an opportunity for the, uh, things like that hopefully to spill out onto the pavement. And then we've got the, um, the Knox block. So this would be our traditional slow street, two-way street environment. As we discussed earlier, the, the buses um, and the proposed changes will be coming up Frederick Street and turning right into George Street and then making the reverse from George Street back into Frederick Street. So how, how we in, do intersection diets in the space and make that um, a, a much uh, improved uh, space is really important. Um, Obviously, the green areas there are indicative amenity areas, parklets, um, things that we, we'd like to put in, included more vegetation. Um, we probably will imp increase slightly the pavement size on the um, shop side of the street, just to allow those food vendors that are obviously located in those shops to have some additional space, potentially, if they would like. Um, and then the amenity area where the car parking is will uh, directly be outside the green space for Knox Block so that the green elements of the street can spill out and, and unify both sides of the street a lot better. The other thing to note is here we've in included um, a Barnes Dance Crossing at the Albany Street intersection. And as Richard said earlier, that five-way intersection will be significantly improved. We want to shorten some of those crossing points potentially if we can. Um, and obviously, um, a change to the phasing of the lights will significantly improve not only the efficiency, but the safety and accessibility of that intersection. Car parking. Right, so we're, we were, we, and I just mentioned briefly before that um, parking, again, it continues to be a, a hot topic during discussion. So we are doing a lot of thinking around how to manage this. So just to give a bit of an idea about what we're looking at, the, the three blocks between Moray and Frederick Street have 35 spaces, and that's where we're looking at significant change, although you would have noticed from those concept designs there is space there to retain a number of, of parks, could be used for mobility, uh, drop-off deliveries, uh, and then some short stay parking, or however we decide to, to use that. And we've obviously got opportunities with new technology to have variable signs at different times of the day that suit different users as well. Uh, in between Frederick and Albany, there's another 21 spaces with less changes proposed. That's retaining its two-way street function, um, and the and, um, majority of that we would expect to be similar, but, but enhanced. So that's the, that's the total number directly impacted on those four blocks. Um, the existing parking within that 500 metre red line, give or, give or take, um, is approximately 1,900 spaces on street and 1,100 spaces off street. Now that's counting all of the big public car parks, including Meridian, which uh, we, we've, we've included for, this, for the purpose of this count. It excludes the large private off street like Countdown and New World that we, we haven't included which the purpose of that is only for people going to those those shops. So just gives an idea of roughly the spaces. We we do acknowledge within within that 500 metre area is a significant amount of residential property um, that puts pressure on the, those spaces and, and the people that live in there that have vehicles 
um, have a need often to to find space on the street as well. So it's not 3,000 free spaces, we, we know that, but it is 3,000 spaces we've got within what would be considered an acceptable distance. Uh, there's a large hill on one side which, which can impact uh, where people are prepared to walk from, um, but largely that, that's a formula that can be used in these instances. In terms of what we're looking at, um, how do we prioritise those the use of those spaces? So we've we've talked about that at previous um, in previous papers with with um, other parking related matters. So um, residents, commuters, and then uh, who who often are working in town, and then short stay who are visiting town for a specific purpose. So what's our what's our priority of use for the spaces we've got? Uh, and probably a, a bigger question we're sp starting to spend a bit more time on, uh, how are we helping people find a park that's available? We don't do a lot, if anything, in the city um, to help people understand where a park is available, be it in a parking building or on the street, uh, and that technology exists now and is being used um, you know, as a matter of course in a lot of places, so that's a part of the, the work that will be undertaken for this project as well, as some of that, that new technology that will help um, help people find a park, there are benefits for enforcement, there are benefits for ease of payment, there are, there are a number of benefits that come with that technology that we need to start looking at. Uh, and the other thing we look at, which is what we always look at, is we have some very wide streets in Dunedin, uh, and we, don't, we have the option to use that space better in terms of putting more parks in. Um, and there are some of those streets within that zone. Uh, and th there are some that are being upgraded shortly outside of that zone to, to make use of that space as well. So those are the sort of things we are putting in the mix to try and give ourselves um, a, a, a good understanding of how we can use the space we've got uh, and how we can make sure we are trying our best to provide for what the people visiting town need. So where are we on the timeline? So as again, um, as is indicated here, from February through to April, we've done significant stakeholder engagement, which is what it says on the first, the left-hand side of the screen. The, um, the concept design stage, uh, we had a target of August, but it's become very clear um, from a project team perspective about what we think the proposal is that we'd like to put to council for the layout of the street and its function. And um, there'll be then a period of activations and pedestrianisation trials, as well as hopefully significant baseline data collection, and then the development of an activity plan. I think the development of the activity plan is really key in uh, bringing the space to life, to increasing the footfall in the street and bringing shoppers and visitors to George Street um, that makes them want to stay for a period and a prolonged period of time. So we've got here um, our construction period proposing to break ground at this point in April 2021. The reason for that is because there's a significant amount of preliminary study that needs to take place to the site conditions on the street. There is an awful lot of things that we know we don't know around heritage things that we could find as we break ground in the street, as well as geotechnical information and lots of great information that will help us manage disruption later so that we can minimize where possible, with as much preparation as possible to, to manage that disruption. And then there's our practical completion. So what I would like to show you is an, an, an indication of what the activity plan could look like. So the activity plan here includes, um, this is the activation and trialing element of what we're showing. So the top left image is Global Parking Day, which is a one day event that takes place across the world in many countries, in many cities across the world, in many places in New Zealand, um, of artistic groups and organizations enjoying being in the street and um, just taking up some space for a short period of time. Also includes permanent parklets. We've discussed that already, and that's something that urban design is obviously taking forward within the wider project team. Uh, ways in which we can close the street off to put on events and activities, as well as nighttime activities, light shows, and, and trying to activate that space after four o'clock, as well as ways in which we can trial things. This is a this is good from a project team perspective to trial what we're putting in. We'll obviously be coming, um, if the design is approved, to a natural peer review as we go through each of the design stages to evolve it, but this is also really good for the community to get a feel about how their street will change. 
And then there's the daytime aspects of the activity plan. The main function of the events and activities that are shown here, they will obviously take place through the construction period to maintain footfall through the street, but also be a little bit of positivity in a very busy time as the street is disrupted. We can't stop the street being disrupted through the construction. However, we can do some really cool things that brings people to it. So here we go, we've got pedestrianisation trials, eatery trials, we've got the opportunity for pop-ups in the street, we've got a water slide running down the street, as well as obviously the electronic bollards you can see in the bottom right image, um, artistic interventions and just nice community events that uh, are things that people would like to attend. And then there's the nighttime aspect. So after four o'clock, we know that the street becomes significantly less activated. So it's really working to put some really great events on that can maintain, help boost the economy of the street through an outdoor cinema, silent disco, as well as a plethora of other things that are proposed in that activity plan that's appended to the report. Um, and these will be evolved as we go. Okay, so... Um, Subject to the report being approved today, there's obviously a huge amount of preliminary study that needs to take place. The public life assessment really is looking at the behavioural studies of all modes of transport through the street, as well as how people um, act, how they move through the street, do they window shop, you know, all of the different aspects and things we can observe. Um, an economic audit, not only of consumer spending in the street and FPOS transactions, as well as the property values, the rental elements of the street, um, and all of the things that have a direct impact on the economy of George Street. An accessibility audit, so the concept design, if approved, will go through a concept, an accessibility audit, which will be done by, all of these be done by um, an, an, an an external um, organization, but essentially the accessibility audit looks at recommendations, constraints for the street, um, as well as where drop curbs need to be, tactiles and ways in which we can improve the design to make it as accessible as possible. An environmental um, study which talks about particulate matter in the air and, and that's in the impact of that on the street, as well as the car parking study that Richard alluded to earlier. Um, some of this baseline data will be collected again at the end of the project um, to review its success. Obviously, there'll be further development of the concept that, that's presented to council today if it's approved. That obviously will include a natural peer review as we take it through with, with other designers and contractors and continue, um, obviously, with the existing procurement we've got to procure those contractors and designers as well as activate the activity plan. So that's it. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll begin. Um, you, one of the elements that's been uh, particularly well received has been the greening and the other additional, much more vegetation. Um, what is the intent in respect of the existing street trees? So we had our arborist, our council arborist, involved in the project team to design, and his thoughts were that we could do a condition survey of the existing greenery in the street, some of which um, looks like it could be a little bit worse for wear, but certainly we will, we will base our, our future decisions about the, the outcome of that tree survey that we're going to complete. Fine, thank you. Um, and in terms of the process, um, should we endorse this concept design today, what opportunity, how will people be able to make comments about that by way of the website? Or is a, you're not talking about a formal, another formal round of a consultation process, are you? No, that's correct. So we would intend to make any future iterations of the designs available through through website and through the stakeholder groups for people to view and, and pass comment on, but it's not our intention to do another formal round of consultation. That's fine, fine. Now, I've got Councillor Hawkins was first, Councillor Newell, Councillor Wilson. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Just a couple of questions um, and problems <coughs> around infrastructure, and you talk about the, the water infrastructure renewals work, which is the impetus predominantly for this happening in the first place. Um, but the other thing that we have hovering around us is at, at the business case development stage is the district energy scheme. 
um, which isn't mentioned here, I'm just seeking assurance that that can be worked into this as it progresses without further delaying the George Street work? Uh, yes, so our project manager has been um, discussing with the staff member in charge of the business case to make sure we're familiar with their timelines um, and that it can inform the design of any underground infrastructure should, should it be necessary on George Street. So this stage we're comfortable that the timelines work. Um, if it was becoming clear that there was going to be a problem, we would need to come, come back and seek some guidance on how we approach that, but at the moment, we're, we're comfortable they are parallel processes, but should it need to be accounted for within the design, we can do that. That's excellent. And my second one was around um, <coughs> the street typologies, to use the technical um, jargon, and, and whatever we decide here or whatever gets progressed, I'm just trying to get a sense of whether should the, the political or public mood move significantly in the near term to shift the balance even further than is currently being proposed, whether the design that's being worked up would prohibit that without... Um, do we have to wait another 30 years when we do the whole street again to, to, do, more, to do more work on this? Um, or, or is the... Is the electronic bollards the best we can get at future-proofing, um, future-proofing future the design of the space? Yeah. So the um, the block proposed as shared space is far simpler to transition through to full pedestrian that, that never has to take vehicles. The positive is that all of all of the designs as they're set out are built to a standard that can take vehicles. They would need to anyway. Um, the shared space with no curbs is less of an issue to transition to something that would be permanently pedestrianised and, and not need to take vehicles. The two slow streets with curbs and effectively still a vehicle carriageway, um, there would need to be some work to those, although not significant. Again, the, the, the base, the infrastructure will all be there, but it might be that there needed to be some change to the surface in terms of paving to make it clear that there was no longer a vehicle if, if it needed to be. The other thing to consider, I guess, in, in taking your point around the public mood is still the need for access to private ways, the need for emergency services and other things which make, make that full pedestrianisation a difficult proposition as the, the two blocks either side of the, that sort of central mall block are, are set out. Yeah, I understand that. But so so the, the changes that would need to be made are aesthetic rather than structural. You're talking about signalling to people what the intention of, of the space is rather than having to fundamentally rebuild the space in any way. Yes. Okay, thank you. Councillor Newell. Thank you, Chair. Um, basically, just following on from um, Councillor Hawkins, um, regarding the retractable bollards, I mean, how, how high on the priority list could we put those? Because I think they, they would be essential. I know they're going to be in the golden block, but I mean, um, if we could sort of stretch, I know there's a big wad of cash sitting there, um, how high on the priority list can we put these damn things, because I think they're going to be crucial. Yeah, look, I, I think they're a, they're a good management tool, even if we're not talking personalisation all blocks. We have a number of events down George Street, we have X number of graduation parades every year, we have a Santa Parade, we have a number of events that would use this space, and hopefully more if post um, upgrades. So to install them is, um, yes, there will be a cost. Um, Yes, it's a significant budget, it's a significant project. Um, so it's not, there's not a lot spare in the design. Um, so, but, but in terms of future proofing for those sorts of things, I would expect to see that type of infrastructure go in as a matter of course, rather than us having to retrofit it. And just secondly, a very, very small point. Um, there were four parks on the opposite side of the farmer's block. Uh, you had four, four parks on the, on the right side where, where the traffic was going, but you had four parks on the other side, I just wonder, and there was a tree there, I was just wondering, pulling out in front of a tree and hitting a cyclist or a lime scooter may not be ideal. Yeah, look, the, the, at the moment that's an indicative use of the space, I mean, there's, there's a number Early of days. safety issues, but I guess what we're trying to demonstrate is that the way that we are allocating the 19 metres between boundary and boundary gives us that room and then through the design, through safety audits and things, it, w it will start to flesh out exactly how we would use that space. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. Kia ora. Um, great stuff. I just, and going down to one of your first um, premises in the Central City Plan is the accessibility and um, connected city and just checking and testing a couple of things that, um, for clarity, 
Take the Edinburgh Way. There are a number of driveways in there. Those are still going to be open to the community. They're going to be accessible. And what those people do with that space will be part of that discussion. Yep, I, I thought so, but it was just reflecting on things I've been saying. Um, interesting, when you talk about bollards, um, the traffic management costs at the moment for having people out manning stopping streets, is, um, having seen one recently for the university parade, um, is quite substantial. And that would take out a lot of costs for the people activating, potentially? It would take out some, depending on the nature of the traffic management, um, yeah. you know, and, and the east whether whether it was impacting east-west movements as well, or it was just north-south between blocks. So there's a number of things that factor into those traffic management costs. Okay, um, your next steps, I, and I love what this is doing, but I, I suppose I'm just checking. Your next steps aren't any trials, and when you look at the um, streetscape design guidelines, they suggest trials. And just checking what that is, because I didn't think the next steps covered trials. So there's trials within the activity plan, okay, yeah, which okay. is part of the next steps. Okay. So um, people say, in, again, the new Edinburgh Way will have a chance to see what it, how it may impact on them by those blocks actually being closed off. Uh, we, we can trial aspects of the design. Mm -hmm. The new Edinburgh Way's the concept design is not to close it, but it's oh, to sorry, yeah. restrict its use. So yes, trialling those types of things. Yeah. Ap ap apologies. So yeah. Yeah, those, thank you. Councillor Vandervis. Does the surface treatments design that you have gone into quite a bit of detail with allow for a central covered box trench for services? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. That's certainly a conversation we've had at a project level, and when we have engaged contractors, um, that will be something that we will be asking them to investigate. We think a single service trench is a, is a very good idea down the main street to reduce service covers and reduce future issues with people div digging up what will be um, you know, new paving. Um, so in terms of underground infrastructure, uh, that's certainly something I expect to see as part of the, the plan that's developed. Rather than asking contractors who will only have a short-term uh, interest, could we not actually make it a council policy in the long-term interests of the city that we really need this facility uh, up the main street? Yeah, look, we'll, we'll, we will be making it very clear that um, that's an outcome we're seeking. If there are technical reasons why they, they can't, they will have to demonstrate that to us. Um, but I, I, I'm completely in agreement that it's, it's the way we should be trying to structure that. Great, thank you. Um, regarding the um, many residents and retailers that have parks accessible currently from George Street, will all their accessibility and their existing use rights be maintained? Uh, yes, so that's one of, one of the key reasons for keeping uh, traffic within those blocks and, and allowing access to those blocks um, is that there is still access for people who retain parks off the main street. That's for the people that retain parks off the main street. What about the retailers that actually uh, want access to the front of their shops that oh, they yes. currently have? Yeah, and, the, and it will space on the street for deliveries, um, mobility parks, short stays. So there's an allocation of parks there. The details to still be worked out, but there is space within the design to provide for that. Okay. Um, would you agree that the most affected parties in this George Street redevelopment are the businesses, the business people in George Street? Uh, look, yeah, I, I think there are a number of affected parties, um, both through the design, through the construction, and a number of parties who will have significant opportunities as well, yes. But in terms of the effect that this plan will have, it's the businesses that it will primarily affect. Uh, yes, bus businesses that will um, primarily who are there 100% of the time, yes. Right, okay. Um, Monday's ODT, um, business says plan will hurt. There is the claim uh, in our papers and claims made by Councillor Benson Pope that history shows that business won't be hurt. What, quest what, what expertise do we have in business, in the City Council, to tell the businesses of our city that they don't know what's going to hurt their business and what won't, 
what mandate do you have for telling the businesses that this will help them when they believe it'll hurt them? So we, we don't have a mandate to make their mind up for them, so I'll be clear about that. We don't tell them anything. What, what we've set out to do is put forward a concept design that we believe satisfied the objectives within council strategic documents and will provide them a, a significantly enhanced public space that will invite people into the central city. That's, that's the mandate we're working from, but I certainly appreciate that some people uh, have expressed concerns about the design and, and that's part of the engagement process. Um, we believe the design we've put forward will provide a, a better space and will meet the objectives that we're trying to work towards. Is it not true that it's not just some people but actually the majority of businesses affected as represented by Heart of Dunedin? And I can quote from uh, Mr La Hood, who is their spokesman, who says that you can have the smartest looking CBD uh, but if you can't easily access the area then retailers will suffer and the area will lack vibrancy the retailers directly affected believe that this plan will hurt them. What is your answer to that? So um, as an open designer, re designing retail um, environments is something that we're used to. I think that we know from the, um, the Global Street Design Guide the number of case studies there in it, my own personal experience of being an urban designer in many countries in the world, that um, increasing footfall in a street means that there's more people in the street to spend money in the street. The, um, the, the design that we've put to council today incorporates all of the feedback that we had through the consultation period, which did include a, sub a submission from Heart of Dunedin, which we've used as a basis, obviously, to consider those businesses and retailers in the street. Um, I have it here if you would like me to summarize any elements of it, but it does incorporate the needs that they've expressed through the consultation. And I would add, Councillor, that experience showed when the work currently in place was done, that most of the retailers who'd, be, who'd expressed concerns about their operations had the good grace to say that the city was correct and business improved because of the improved physical environment. And I've got absolutely no doubt that that is what will happen again. Councillor Elder. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of questions. Um, it's one way going from north to south and I was just wondering where the cyclists and scooters going north to south go. So the south moving um, element of the one way from Frederick Street through to Murray Place, all vehicles will be <coughs> using the, the main street and the contraflow will be the smaller modes, the bicycles, electronic scooters and those modes heading north. It's the smaller modes and pedestrians obviously that can travel north through those three blocks. Um, so they just go in with the So on, on both a slow street and a shared space, the, the speed of the traffic within a slow street, it would be 30 k's. Within a shared space, it's 10 kilometres an hour. So they, they move with the traffic um, in all, all of those other modes. Mm. Oh, so the, the traffic is slower on those streets? Correct. Okay. Council of Lord. Um, I just have another... Um, oh, sorry. Question. So, um, for the businesses um, affected, um, you're doing little trials, like in different areas, like blocking off one area or making it one way. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so, the activity plan has some activations and trials, and that we would like to we'd like to deliver. We haven't decided exactly the format of what those look like at the moment, but certainly they'll be incorporated into the activity plan as a, as a key event to take place initially. Um, just um, a comment and then a question. Um, in the South Dunedin Festival, we blocked the street off and for the first time we had seats and tables. And um, I talked to the retailers and they said, once we had seats and tables that the number of people going into the shops increased incredibly so um, will there be research as to what happens when you do such activations and feedback from the retailers about it? So one of the, obviously in the next steps is some economic data, baseline data that we need to collect. That will provide some recommendations, but it also will talk about urban design element recommendations that does just that councillor elder. Looks at the consumer spend increases behind the till through activations and trials. Councillor Lord. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, Richard, you did make a very good point, or I don't know if everyone picked up exactly what you were meaning, but I think of the parking, and I, I came down York Place the other night, about oh, Sunday night it was, about 6.30, I guess, and I noticed that all the parks up on the angle were already occupied, so the, the point that those parks are not necessarily available, for, the 3,000 parks aren't all there. Now, my question is, I believed when I came down I was looking for signs or metres and I couldn't see anything, so it would appear to me that someone can park there all day, all week, and go away on the weekend to come back. If they're lucky, they'll still get their park. So my question is that if those parks are already taken out by people that presumably live in the vicinity and the flats that have been once a three-bedroom home, now a ten-bedroom flat sort of thing, um, are we planning any work that might um, encourage people to move? And I think a lot of the people that work around here in the buildings, they, they park for a four-hour park, um, come in at 8.30, move the car at 12.30, or pay again for another four hours. Is there any thought in that parking survey that you've been doing that those streets might change? Uh, all, all of those are... Um or anything within the central city zone where we're, we yeah, we did that general parking um, engagement was it 12 18 months ago now and and a num you know there are a number of areas within around the central city where there are pressures between the different parking users so we need to look at all of those um, and and have you know that your point you makes a good one a lot of those parks are taken up by residents within the area a lot of them who have multiple cars per unit um, and there is pressure for us to provide parking for them just as we have pressure to provide it for commuters as well so that balance we'll need to keep working on and keep yeah. looking at how we allocate the, the different spaces we've got I'm a bit lucky I can park about 10 cars yet so my house and there's never any pressure for any of those spots. Question councillor? <laughs> question, yeah. Um, the, the other question was I did note in the ODT had done a survey and there was, I think the figure was about 76% support for what they'd seen but I did also um, think of Jason Hood and the Heart of Dunedin and can I just um, be assured although they've given a submission you know, Heart of Needham is one group, you can get 10 or 15 teenagers say something, does that cancel out like that or have you weighted the value of what they've said? No, look, we've, we've had um, a number of conversations with Heart of Needham, recognising that they play a critical role on the main street. Um, again, we, we balance off their comments with, with those of the general public, but um, not in terms of five people and, and five people. We, we do recognise as a yeah, collective the they have means. a significant um, interest in the space and how it's used. The, the challenge we've got is to try and achieve a number of the things that even they seek as a group in terms of an improved space for pedestrians and, and more encouragement of business. We have to make better use of the space we've got, which means something else gets compromised or, or something else gets changed. In this case, we've changed the way the traffic flows to create more space, to give us more opportunity to, to create the type of environment that we're hearing people want. Um, now, that's that has, you know, based on the um, the article on Monday, obviously raised some concerns within um, Heart of Dunedin, which we'll need to continue to, to work on and, and discuss with them. But ultimately, um, if we want to make these changes and achieve some of these things, there are going, we've got to change something. And that's the challenge we've got. Um, otherwise, we're not really making any, any difference in that space. You did make a, a comment that the the modelling would suggest it's going to be difficult to achieve all the outcomes. And, well, that might not have been the exact words, but you, you did say that modelling does prove, or that there are problems that you will have to overcome if we change anything. Oh, modelling. So, the, um, well, the modelling demonstrates that the chain, the network can handle the changes. Um, there, there will be, you know, there are going to be uh, compromises um, to be made in terms of the way people travel and where they travel um, by forcing them off, um, off particularly the northbound off George Street and into yeah. Falloul or Great King. Uh, but we have. Um, we have uh, signals that we can use to, to favour certain and, and allow people to keep moving. So there are ways and, and means of, of achieving that, but it will. You know, I think we need to be upfront. It's going to be a significant change because of the way George Street's currently used. <coughs> I think one of the comments I've heard around the place lately is that we used to be a 10-minute city, but now we've become a 20-minute city. But I, I'd just like to hope you're confident that this, these types of changes can be enacted without turning us into a 30-minute city. 
it's not going to just cripple us in that regard. Oh, look, I, I'm, I'm confident it won't cripple us. I, I think we, we have a network that can, that can take um, a significant volume of traffic and we've got ways and means of managing that traffic. Um, it will. You know, what we're saying here is that we believe more priority on the main street should be given to pedestrians and people who want to come in and use the space rather than vehicles. So those that use it currently as their north-south corridor are going to have to look at a different option. Thank you. Councillor Garrow. Thank you. Um, you've covered this question off to some degree, um, but I just want to take it from a different angle. First of all, thank you for the work on this. I find it really exciting. Um, for the people in our community that perhaps rely on the Otago Daily Times, for example, for their information, um, who may not have been involved in the stakeholder consultation, and, and the first they knew of it really was that front page article in the ODT and that idea that somebody in the heart of Dunedin, the, the suggestion they weren't happy with it, um, and jumping to the conclusion that we hadn't consulted them, which in fact is totally the opposite, um, are we, and, and perhaps don't know that best practice is and that uh, increased footfall means increased uplift in the retail, um, and it's counterintuitive to them to think that that's the case. How are we going to communicate that to that wider community, maybe the 30% who aren't on board. And it's not my view, I just am putting that there is a, a group of people in the community who perhaps just don't know that stuff. Yeah, that, that's it's a good question, but it's also a, um, a difficult one. We, we, we have tried through this process to be as open and push out as much information as we could through social media, websites, stakeholder groups, newsletters. Uh, we, we can't get to everybody. Um, where they do find something and think that you know they would like more information then we have as much information as we can within the website and we've got Garrett within the transport team who keeps that communication material up to date uh, or they can contact someone myself or Catherine or sure. one of the team so I'm comfortable we've done as best we can to give anyone anyone that wanted to the chance to engage with us sure. and that that's that's about as far as we can go and then obviously making information available that those that may miss out but are still interested. Sure, thank you for your answer. Thank you. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Um, Richard, Catherine, um, looking at all the imagery, one of the things that uh, I've sort of looked at over and over again is trying to rationale in my head, what do these streets look like that we may have already visited? So for example, what would look like Lampton Quay our version of Lambton Quay, what would look like our version of Fort Street, what would look like our version of Federal Street in Auckland? And how does that all play out? And I haven't seen that in the report. Okay, so I'll just bring up those visualisations, but for you, Councillor Wiley and Sean, tell you uh, where other things have taken place that are similar. So the, um, the shared space, the one-way street, is uh, and a good example of that is Fort Street in Auckland. A commercial one-way street is something that's taken place in numerous places in the UK as well as in America. Um, and the obviously a slow street environment, a two-way standard street is something that happens all over Dunedin as well. So um, some examples we have of shared spaces working very effectively um, in the Global Street Design Guide, um, Lower Cuba Street and Fort Street. Um, of, so that's another thing, slow street environment obviously is something like Lower Cuba Street, a shared space, um, Fort Street. I've got baseline data that they've collected from the outset and then they've evaluated at the end and again I've showed um, by increasing that pedestrian dominance, still having vehicles driving through the street, that this there is a, a reduction in through movement of traffic but not a removal and certainly a significant increase of uh, consumer spend and perception of safety. So these are um, typologies that are used in numerous places closer to home and a little bit further away. Um, another good example is Bendigo in Australia, which I know some councillors have attended through their um, council staff. That is the, of the same population as Dunedin, and they have used a combination of slow streets and shared spaces throughout the whole of the CBD. So this works. Okay, so I'm getting, I guess, from, from me and the people that I talk to, and the wider community is having actually that wider expressed. And so if people are out, traveling out of town, they can see, oh, actually, this is, this is going to be our version of Federal Street, that type of thing. So that's what I'm trying to, are we, is there a way to tell that story a little bit better 
and more effectively. Yeah, we could we could look at um, sharing those ideas. I mean, the caveat on that is that we we've tried not to be too explicit because this design process is about getting something that's fit for Dunedin. Um, the the we can certainly identify some similar streets in terms of their their type of of use and, and how people interact with them, but I would caution against us saying that, you know, the, the more I, uh, the, the St Andrews to Hanover Street block is going to look like Federal Street because people will go there and say, well, it, so we've got to be careful about how we describe that, certainly in general terms, until in terms of its design principles. Um, we, could, we could, on our website, start making some, um, some comparisons to other streets around the country and, and just make sure people are aware that it's more around the principle of the design than the detail of the design. I guess it would look a lot closer to Federal Street than it would look like to how it currently is. Yeah, so that's the analogy I'm trying to get at. So is the design what we see here essentially the design? Is this going to be it? Or I've heard at times saying, Here's the design, and then I've heard, yeah, there will be further input. So I'm trying to gauge. So yeah, as 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 with any con preliminary concept design, we'll have to refine the design as it goes through the design stages. But certainly, we wanted to bring to council an idea of how the space would be allocated, the streets layout and function, as well as some high-level <coughs> indicative visualizations of how George Street will look and feel. So yes, we will be refining this as we go through the process, um, as we get to technical design. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm sort of thinking the annual plan, we talked about a loop bus, and my understanding the loop bus would be travelling down George Street, and how and that would play out in, in this model? So, and we did discuss this at annual plan, so the, um, the feasibility study around the, um, that we will undertake with ORC for any, any future Central City loop bus would need to take into account um, any the future design of George Street. So obviously there is an option for it still to move in a north-south direction, but if it was going to be running a, a contraflow loop to that, it would need to be using Great King or uh, Falul Street. So that's that's to be fleshed out as part of that um, feasibility study. Okay. Uh, question 21 on page 62, uh, 21A. It talked about pedestrian count, movement count, car, scooter, or vehicle um, uh, vehicle movement. Is that currently underway? Has that been underway like the last 12 months or is that...? Well, some of those are underway. Uh, some of them are still still to go uh, get Proceed. put under contract for, okay. so we start gathering it. But we do, we do have um, a means of counting um, vehicles, pedestrians at intersections and other movements. Okay. Um, something that sort of got raised in an earlier question uh, and I can see it sort of concerned me a little bit should XYZ uh, person become a mayor of the city in the, in the election? And they have gone out and they've talked about pedestrianisation of George Street. Is this an ability for where it's, not, it's easy for them to do that? Uh, uh, look, I, oh, I, I think, I, no, I suppose I'll respond no, in Richard, the same... Richard, I don't think that's a fair question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> decisions about George Street are made by the council, and that's the end of the conversation. Uh, got another question, Councillor? Uh, yes, I do. Um, one, que one thing that I haven't quite seen articulated in this report is what the other streets are going to look like and the movement traffic flows are going to be. So Faleel Street, Cake, Great King Street, how the rest of the city is going to flow around this, uh, this street. Yeah, look, the, the idea is that the obviously the east-west connections would need to be strengthened. So at the moment, if, if you're on George Street, the, the north-west, uh, sorry, the north-south movement is, is favoured. Um, we would be seeking to um, shift that priority to the east-west movements to get people through George Street or across the city to where they need to go. The movements along Falul and Great King would, would effectively remain the same, but there'd be some intersection improvements. Um, there's some widening work to be done on a portion of Great King Street so it can take all the buses that it needs to take. Um, but fundamentally, their use remains uh, similar to as it is now. We would just be ensuring that the phasing of lights gave enough of a volume of traffic to keep, keep things moving. Okay, so one final question. The date of April 2021 was potential construction. How does that fit in with the hospital timeline or potential timeline? Can anybody answer that? Uh, my understanding is that there will be some overlap between the George Street project and the start 
of demolition and potentially construction of the first building. Um, so there will need to be some traffic management um, put in place, and which would have to happen anyway. Um, again, we're, we're reasonably comfortable, and one of the reasons George Street was selected as the first project is that we think we can work on it without having a detriment effect on the broader network, and, and that that temporary traffic management can work alongside anything with the hospital or, or alter other university projects. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Councillor Stebbin. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, thanks, Catherine Richard. Um, I, uh, paragraph 11 uh, talks about um, additions, etc., and it mentions the street furniture. And I know um, Councillor Benson Pope's asked before um, about our street furniture. Like we've got some existing light poles, um, rubbish bins, seating stuff. Are we looking at utilising that uh, in a way to save money rather than just tossing it into the bin? Um, so um, materials palette and what those specific pieces of furniture look like, we haven't decided any of that yet. Um, beyond deciding that obviously all paving treatments will need to be permeable, um, but certainly the street furniture and existing infrastructure and condition of existing infrastructure is something that we can look at, but certainly we don't want to compromise the way the street looks and feels. So some of those elements will need to be retained, but um, certainly um, we'll, we'll be putting together holistic design at a later stage that says specifically what each of those items look like and where they're from. And if, if we do go for new infrastructure over existing infrastructure, we have a significant number of areas of the city that could be enhanced with even reusing infrastructure currently on George Street. So none of it will go to waste where there is an alternative use for it. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. <coughs> Mr Chair, thanks for your report guys, very exciting. Um, I've got a question that sort of follows on from Councillor Hawkins' question about future proofing, um, but it's from a disabled people's perspective. So disabled persons often find um, curbs a barrier to, um, to movement and given that we can engineer for rain and stormwater events on the shared space, it doesn't have a curb. What's the requirement for a curb in the vehicle areas? Well, I guess my rhetoric, maybe another way, is there a requirement for a curb, or if we're considering future-proofing of shape and disabilities, could we consider in the design process something that allows especially wheelchair access without requirement of curb cuts? We, we want to make an environment that's inclusive of everybody and all their requirements. So yes, certainly that's something that we can look at. One of the elements, um, that, as I said earlier, for the, the data collection and the studies required going forward is to do an access audit on what we've put forward, which will give specific prescriptions about things that we're supposed to be putting in um, that are legally tested. Um, good New Zealand standards. So. Um, Ongoing conversations we've had with the members of the Access for All Forum are really happy with the design, obviously, and just get into that detailed design later. But yeah, we will certainly be looking into that. Thank you. I don't think I have a mic on for that. Um, I'm just going to bring up the loss of parking again as a question. It's often brought up as a concern. Um, generally speaking, has it been your experience, and I'm saying this to Catherine, that, that often is not retail organisations often bring this up when this has happened all around the world and that generally speaking once it's over there has been a certain amount of positivity from those very same people later i think um from my experience of delivering projects like this before it's it seems a scary prospect to significantly disrupt the street and um council on uh, you know in the development of the project as we take it forward we will be having regular ongoing conversations with the community to work alongside them. Heart of Dunedin have been involved in the, the, the formation of the activity plan in managing that disruption, but certainly, yeah, that's for, for retailers and independent stores, that can be a challenge, but certainly um, we, we don't, we're not ending the conversation at this point. We want to work together ongoing. Very specific question about the parking buildings. Um, both the Hanover Street access to the Meridian Building and the um, Great King Street access have no right turns into their entrances. Is there going to be a, chain, a review of the um, access points to basically stop east west movements going across the George Street area? Uh, so we, we will, we um, were at a forum with uh, Chamber of Commerce the other day and representative from Meridian was there, so we had a brief discussion about their car park, which, you know, there are some challenges with entrance and egress from that car park that I think we could probably 
improve. Um, so with them and also with the uh, DCC's Great King Street car park, as you point out, it's not, again, as well as not having any information to assist people to find where it is and whether their space is free, it's also very hard to get into if you don't come at it from the right direction. <laughs> so there is definitely some work we can do there. Thank you. Councillor Lofisto. Been answered. Uh, Councillor Vandervis. The Heart of Dunedin spokesman said that he was concerned that there was no more parking that had been provided to offset the substantial parking provided by bulk retailers on the fringe of the city. Given that no more parking has been provided and there's going to be a loss of parking and we have an increasing population, do you not see that this is invariably going to push uh, car-bound people, and there are a lot of them, to do their shopping elsewhere, where there are car parks? I, I can't make comment on people's personal choices for where they'll shop. I, th I think the offering in George Street is very different to bulk retail. I think that the space that's currently provided for people that visit the central city is not one that encourages people to stay any longer than they need to, and, and that's something that came up in a lot of conversations with Heart of Dunedin and other retail groups as well. Uh, I, I think that we have we have a, num a, a, a good inventory of parking in the central city that has some challenges in terms of how many people need access to it, for how long and for what purpose. Uh, so no, look, I, I, my opinion is the design we've come up with is, is the right design with the right balance and in terms of its direct impact on parks within those four blocks is negligible as a, as a percentage of the overall parking inventory. How we use the rest of that inventory and how we assist people to use it is probably more of a relevant question. Is it not the case that how we use the rest of the inventory already is forcing commuters further and further out of town forcing them to the green belt, forcing them into areas of the green belt that they now no longer can park, and then into suburban Dunedin, where I live, uh, so that I can't get a park outside my house anymore. Is it not the case that uh, changes in policy have meant that commuters in particular are being pushed further and further out? Uh, there, have, there have been um, parking changes made by this council that have um, provided more parks closer to town for visitors uh, and residents as opposed to free all day parking for commuters. Yes, that is that are decisions that have been passed through council in, in the recent years. Uh, and that is a conversation we need to continue around how, how we are providing for the various types of parking in the city. But this plan doesn't provide any more parks. In fact, it's going to... This plan's some... relevant for George Street, so it doesn't address that wider parking issue directly. Wow. Councillor Thank you. Elder. Um, related to that, um, I note that you said there was opportunity in wide streets, is that right, for creating more parks? How would that happen? So where we have a, um, a wide carriageway that um, our engineers assess, so... Um, Manor, Manor Place down by Market Reserve is the one that we are changing at the moment. Um, we had parallel parking on the Market Reserve side of that street and it was identified as an opportunity to put an angled parking which has created an extra 24 spaces. Um, there's a number of those similar um, projects happening up in the Central City Schools area where we have very wide streets. We're narrowing entranceways into those streets to reduce speeds which opens up more space to shift parallel parking to angled parking. Um, Pitt Street is one that comes to mind that's incredibly wide right on the fringe of this project that, that has opportunities for that as well and you can get significant gains by, by shifting to an, an angle or a 90 degree park. So it would, the wide street project has potential to actually enable um, a number of extra parks and people being able to access the city by foot? Uh, uh, from their from their parking. The, yeah, there are some streets we can look at that, and, and that's a safety assessment and and how the the street operates. But yes, there are opportunities for it. So again, how many extra men are placed? Twenty four. I got us off the top of my head. Yes, I drive up there, and it's it's really impressive what um, Nick and them have done. Hmm. All right, that's the end of my list of questioners. So I'll go back to Councillor Newell, whom I think <coughs> wanted to move this. And seconded by Councillor Hawkins. 
Councillor Stedman, everyone else? Sorry, got in first. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much for the report and uh, your presentation today. Um, I'm aware of the tension between the transport movements and uh, the design imperatives. Neither of you seem too beaten up, so well done. Um, the vast majority of our citizens and our submitters have not only approved um, the bold design, but have absolutely loved it. The only negativity that I've encountered is uh, the perception that they're losing something that they possibly um, can't drive down where they always have, and we know how much people like change. Um, I think if we had the opportunity to design, uh, if we worked backwards and had the, the opportunity to design a city um, from scratch, um, the thought of having cars and trucks and buses and everything right in the middle of it wouldn't really make sense, other than obviously service, mobility and emergency. by previous councils. Uh, thankfully, we survived the tilt slab generation of the 80s and 90s. We're now giving it a much needed update, and um, I think this will not only preserve it, but enhance it and make it far more livable and friendly and safer. Um, it may mean that we may not be able to park outside our favorite shop, uh, but we will interact more with our city and its heart, and God forbid its inhabitants. We'll be able to stay, play, live, and enjoy, but most importantly, feel safe. Um, I note that we do have uh, support uh, in the main from the Chamber of Con Commerce in Mana Whenua, and I think that again is a uh, testimony to the consultation process that you've gone through, so I thank you for that, and I hope that uh, the fellow councillors around the table support it. Thank you. Okay, further speakers? Councillor Gary. Thank you. I want to give real credit to the team that's got us thus far. Um, not an easy job, and the, the engagement with stakeholders uh, was very significant uh, and very well received. When I studied ur urban geography for my degree, stage three, um, I got really excited about the potential and around ergonomics in a city, and I never thought that I would be able to understand and think about this in a different way for my own city. Um, so I thank you for that. Uh, it's a particularly exciting topic, uh, how we can mould and shape a city centre uh, to accommodate um, the society that we have. And those bumping into places that we call placemaking are so significant. Uh, when I visited Bendigo uh, on council business, I, was, I went on a walking tour and saw for myself uh, the potential, what can happen, and I heard the journey they had gone through, um, which at times I think was challenging uh, to get to where they are now. And certainly there were some commonalities between our population size, um, between a near neighbour uh, for us. I particularly want to note that this supports our strategic direction. Um, that underpins, as you said, what we're doing here. And I want to thank you for championing um, the most vulnerable users in our city, most vulnerable members of our, our society, our community, uh, those who require uh, access from a mobility perspective, and for those young families. Um, and the idea being that if you accommodate the, the youngest child and the most frail in our society, then you accommodate and include everyone. And I thank you for that inclusiveness. I will be most definitely supporting this, um, and I note the support of the majority of our community. Councillor Van Vis. Councillors Benson, Pope and Newell have said uh, here and, and in the newspaper that our main street, George Street, is the best in the country, and I agree with them. I like it better than any of the other streets that you might want to go down anywhere else in the country. That begs the question, why would you want to spend $60 million of mostly borrowed money to change what is the best street already in the country? Where does the arrogance come from that you can tell the businesses of this city that they won't be hurt when that's what they do for a living, that's what their whole uh, professional experience is, and we are telling them, no, it's not going to hurt you, everything will be lovely, you'll get to love it when, when, once it's all done and, and, and the pain stops. There is this 
talk often here around the table about the perception of the provision of car parking. Again, I see talking about the perception of car parking as an extraordinary arrogance. Most people in this city have a car and have difficulty finding parks, especially in the central city, especially near George Street. If you want to go to the dental school, if you want to go to the hospital, if you want to go to a bank, if you want to go to the university, finding a car park is a nightmare. If you talk to staff at the hospital, senior nursing staff, they have had specific meetings, particularly about the stresses that people are under trying to get a, a, a park so that they can attend either an operation or uh, whatever they have to do at the hospital and that these parks are simply not available. And the major stress for a lot of people getting an operation in Dunedin Hospital isn't the operation itself, it's actually finding somewhere to park and actually getting there on time. There's been a lot of talk about changing modes of transport. I've heard this changing modes of <coughs> transport line trotted out, I think, ever since Jinty McTavish was on council. And quite frankly, the changing modes of transport has come to stick in my ear really uncomfortably because what it actually means is forcing people out of their cars. Changing modes of transport, getting people into buses, getting them to somehow walk a, a great distance in whatever weather, uh, whatever their, their state of uh, physical health might be. All of these changes that we as a council, with our own car parks right here next door, always there for us, are going to force on the population of ratepayers and use their money, their rates money, to actually pay for a lot of this stuff, I just find extraordinary. If you want to look at what pedestrianisation has done near Dunedin, you only have to look at Christchurch's Cathedral Square, which used to be vibrant prior to it being pedestrianised. And then it became, quite frankly, one of the ugliest uh, centre cities, uh, uh, squares in the whole city, in the whole country. I find the um, uh, slow and deliberate march of pedestrianisation into a kind of philosophy that, that, that has permeated this council and previous councils and just seems to get worse year by year, that somehow the evil car has got to go. And to save the planet, we've got to get everybody back onto buses. To me, this is simply absurd. The car is the most phenomenal, social positive that has been invented in the last 100 years. It has uh, become ubiquitous. It's become cheaper. It's become more efficient. It has become the major source of everybody's transportation because it is cheaper, it's more efficient, and it's more versatile. Trying to force people back into 1950s buses and trains and walking, to me, is trying to put a genie back in the bottle that simply won't go there. My concern is we're spending a lot of money to make a lot of changes in George Street, and we're going to end up ruining the day. The retailers are going to suffer. Uh, shopping is going to uh, start to extend more out to places where people can more easily uh, shop. And, of course, to the internet, where they don't even have to get into their car in the first place. I believe we need to vote against this. I voted against it from the off because I saw it as, quite frankly, a manifestation of a dark green pedestrianisation agenda. And I don't believe it's going to be good for the retailers. The retailers themselves don't believe it's going to be good for them. And I think it's extraordinary arrogance that we are going to sit around here, none of us having retail experience, possibly except me, and, and tell people, yeah, you can <coughs> laugh, I ran a retail operation in this town for more than 22 years. 
And one of the main reasons my retail operation was able to be successful is I built my own car park and I doubled the size of it. And I couldn't have run the business without it. I can afford to be here now because of the success of my retail operation. So if you want to discount the retailers, if you want to force people out of their cars and into buses, then go ahead and vote for this. But you do so at your peril. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. And we've heard a bit about extraordinary arrogance uh, just now and that um, we've been accused of forcing people out of their cars. I think What I think is extraordinary is assuming that everybody, everybody in this community, should they have a choice, would prefer to drive everywhere and park everywhere when what we are increasingly told by people in our community, particularly young people in our community, is what they want are alternatives to having to do that. Uh, and we've been quite sluggish in providing them, and I think this is, uh, this is a step towards that. I want to thank staff uh, for their work, not in a gratuitous way, um, but just because of the sheer amount of work that has gone into this project and will continue to do so. And I confess to being a bit anxious uh, on Saturday morning as I waited for this to become public knowledge. Uh, and to see what, the, uh, what the, the public feedback would be. And I think it's been remarkable uh, how positive it's been, both in person and online. The amount of enthusiasm for this uh, has, been, has taken me by, by pleasant surprise. And I think there's two reasons for that. One is um, the, the breadth and depth of engagement work that staff have undertaken with, with our community in advance of this. Uh, and the other, uh, frankly, is that I, I think this plan is quite conservative, really. Um, we've heard from the feed, we've heard the feedback we got. A few people said do nothing. Uh, far, far more said shut the thing to cars altogether, and we've landed somewhere in the middle. Um, so I don't think this is um, uh, I don't think this is uh, by by any means uh, a radical proposal. I mean, of course, for those who would see any investment in cycling or walking or the removal of a single car park absolutely anywhere is tantamount to treason. Um, this isn't going to be something that will be, uh, this will be well, well received, but I think they're in a shrinking minority uh, of our population in the feedback uh, that has shown that. 25 car parking spaces, um, quite rightly prioritised towards um, short stays and mobility parking is quite a lot really for a, a downtown main shopping street um, that is focusing on a shift towards um, pedestrian space. It's, um, and and I, I applaud um, the prioritisation of those. As I said, this isn't radical or revolutionary. Um, this is catching up with the rest of the world, uh, really, and that's certainly something that is, that is very welcome. Uh, and so I support this um, for all of those reasons, but also because we've, it's not, we've been assured that it won't be built in such a way that further progress couldn't be, can't be made should the public or political will or the east-west uh, east traffic route challenges um, be met in other ways that would allow us uh, to do that, although I, you know, I, I acknowledge that um, temporary interventions through the electronic bollards will allow us a greater degree of flexibility. Um, we are constantly told by young people in our community that this is the kind of city that they want to live in, and we are often told by major employers in the city that this is the kind of city that their employees or prospective employees expect to live in, uh, and this is a small step um, towards towards doing that, um, creating a central city um, that is pedestrian friendly and that finally reflects the stories of our, of our mana whenua who have been conspicuous in their absence in urban design uh, here in our colonial downtown museum. Um, the focus has been on urban design because that's what the pictures will do, but I think it's important to remember the work that was commissioned around the long-term plan where we looked at um, projects, the, looked at the major projects uh, from the perspective of which of these things would contribute to our goals around um, reducing the city's carbon footprint and the two major projects that were identified through that were the central city plan and, and the tertiary uh, precinct work. They were the two um, primarily because of their ability to encourage uh, that kind of, um, to encourage those kinds of alternative travel modes for people who want to access the central city. Uh, but I also want to reflect on the previous long-term plan where we had a couple of young students arrive with a particularly detailed uh, and articulate presentation for how they wanted to see their CBD function around the Octagon and Lower Stewart Street uh, and a shift towards greater use of pedestrian space. And it's with a degree of embarrassment, really, the lack of progress that we've made since then. But I welcome um, this work um, because it allows us um, to give effect to uh, that ambition that has been expressed to us 
Um, the, the anxiety of local businesses and retailers uh, uh, is to be expected, and, and that's understandable, but I'm confident in the international experience that will show that this is the right thing to do. Um, and I'm reminded of a survey we did of, um, or someone did, uh, of, of retailers in the uh, Wall Street Mall or one of the shopping malls where they asked the, the shops how they thought all of their customers traveled to their shop, and then they asked the customers how they traveled to their shops, and there was a significant overstatement on behalf of the retailers there in terms of how many people drove and parked in terms of accessing that. And so um, I think it's important to acknowledge those anxieties, but there's <coughs> always going to be a tension between the perception and reality around um, how people travel to a business, uh, how, people access, um, how people access those things and how those things are best, are best to be mitigated. Um, so thanks again uh, to the staff for this work. Uh, it's incredibly exciting to get to this oft delayed point. Uh, and I look forward to the detailed design work being thrashed out over the next few months. Thanks. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Um, I'll be supporting this, um, which there has been a lot of work done, and um, there's a lot of been a lot of engagement. And yes, staff have done a good job, and, and it's great to have Catherine and your team that what you've done on that basis and having led by Richard. But I think the key thing that I look at is that, and this comes from someone who never supported the $60 million upgrade um, and lost that vote, so you've got to move on, is that status quo is not an option here. Can always be right. No, it can't be, bugger. <laughs> Um, so status quo is not an option. We do have to do work in the street. We do have to dig up the street, and that's important to get on and do. What the street looks like after that is going to be important. My real concern is about movement and activity, and I've seen streets get closed and shut down and get lost to the community, and that was, that's been always been one of my fears. George Street has got to be and be a vibrant street and our most vibrant street in the city. I have been a retailer. I spent many years retailing in different communities, and I've seen how retail has changed over the years. The one thing that we know for sure is the retailers we have in that street today may not be the retailers we have in the street in 10 years. It could be totally different retail. Nobody we ever thought we would have so many cafes and bars operating in George Street today that we, you know, 20 years ago. The streets are going to evolve in relation to the demographic and the people. My fears come more about what's going to happen with the rest of the roads and the streets and the, the movements, and also all the activity happening around the city. So the key thing is, let's get, basically get on with it. So thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Um, obviously, I'm going to be supporting this too. Um, I just want to make a couple of points that sort of relate to something that Councillor Vandiver said. Um, I know of a business in town that has 10 young employees, and we were trying to get them to take something to the electricians the other day, and it turned out that only two of the 10 have driver's licences. The other eight don't have a car and can't even drive one because they don't even have a driver's licence. And they reflect, I think, a change in the demographics of, of the country and of the city. And their, their choice not to even bother with a car is an indicator of the fact that they don't really want a car-dominated city. Um, and that relates to the other question of how do you deal with this idea that we're supposed to be providing all-day car parks for workers. I think it, that's fine for a small country town. But we have aspirations to grow, and that means we're going to have to bring a rapid transit system into this city that's going to be able to move workers in and out on a predictive scale. So we don't have this halo effect of cars. That's an aside, but I think that if you let that dominate your design, you'll never get to where your design needs to be. I want to also specifically touch on the comments around Cathedral Square. I had the fortune or misfortune to go to high school in Christchurch, so I spent a few years there. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I support the Highlanders now, so you know where I sit. Um, <laughs> well away from my cousins. Um, the actual retail area of Christchurch is Lower Colombo Street and around Castle Street, and they pedestrianised that in the 1970s, early 1980s. No, 1970s. And that was so successful that after the earthquake, the very first thing that the people of the city wanted was Castle Street stores to be reactivated, and you got the Castle Street pop-up mall. 
Cathedral Square was never the retail area of the city. It was where the government buildings were circled around the cathedral. It was really the transport centre of where the, where the trams and the buses used to go. But retail-wise was always in Lower Colombo and Cashel, and Cashel was pedestrianised years ago, very successfully. So I don't think that using that is a good example because I don't think it's an accurate description of what went on in that city. I look forward to what we're doing next. I think we need to do this. It's part of making us an attractive city. I was thinking about this the other day. People are attracted, city, attracted to cities you know, by the weather and the ambience. We can't do much about our weather. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's up to making this a livable place if we want to make this an attractive city. And I think this is, this is a great step towards it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stebman. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, firstly, well done to the team. Um, a big job um, and getting it right and trying to appease the public because at the end of the day, no one's ever going to, you're not going to 100% happy. Um, so it's about finding that happy medium. I think this is a happy medium um, between having the traffic the way it is currently and going to full pedestrianisation. This way we get to um, get the ratepayers or our public along with the journey and then learning um, about where we want to possibly go together. Um, yeah, they might not be happy at the start, but once they realise what is actually, uh, what can happen. Um, I myself, you know, I've mentioned before going to Brisbane, and uh, I like going to Brisbane, um, and recently I've been to Sydney, um, and I like to go shopping, and it's nice to actually walk around and actually have an experience when you're doing that. There's the cafes there, so you go and have a bit of shop, you relax, uh, you're in a safe environment without traffic uh, fl flowing around, and you, you actually possibly end up spending a bit more money because you're actually in a happy place. Um, and that's when people spend money when they're in a happy place at the end of the day. So it's all part of that experience. Um, one of my team today actually mentioned what I was going to be up to today at council. And I said, well, I said, well we're actually discussing um, this matter here. She goes, oh, why are they ripping up, the, uh, why are they changing all that main street and stuff? And I said, well, actually, it's all part of the renewals of um, underneath. And um, so it's sort of... There's no point redoing it in the future. And she goes, oh, that's smart thinking. That's not wasting money. She's a young mum of three, um, and she can be quite vocal at times, especially at work. So I was, um, I was, quite, I was very pleasantly surprised by her, um, her reaction to it. Um, I, like Councillor Hawkins, was actually um, a wee bit apprehensive when, I, when this subject was going to come out to the public. And I thought, oh, do I avoid Facebook and stuff like that? No, but you got you have a look. And actually, I was very pleasantly surprised by the reaction. Um, and I thought, no, we've got it right here. So um, well done. And um, I look forward to it actually getting the spade in the ground and actually getting it happening. Thank you. Councillor Elder. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I, I was really interested in um, the work you ha had actually done around parking and your audits around that and the ongoing work. And um, why I brought up Manor Place is should there need to be more parks, there are wide streets around the central um, district that can be used for angle parking and create more parks should that ne be needed. And um, so also the future, as um, Lee says, is maybe driverless cars and driverless buses and, and things like that. So we don't know what the future technology when it comes to um, maybe having um, a driverless bus or driverless car in the future. Um, so I think that can be addressed, I really do. And with those smart little parking apps, people can find parks if need be. So I'm looking forward to that space and, and how you manage it. I'm really, really pleased that um, you're doing this as a partnership and all the consultations you've been doing with youth, with the Business Association, with the people of disabilities, that whole partnership model. But one of the biggest things for me is that you're working with Okaha and looking at um, place making for Māori because when I went up the east coast of the North Island recently um, up to Waiho Bay, I knew I was in a, a, a place where Māori culture was a living and, and, and beautiful culture that was reflected in um, the buildings and um, structures around in the, in the community. And, I think for me that's really, really important when it comes to identity that 
um, our, we can see our own ref um, identities reflected back to us and feel proud of it. And for the Māori people, I think that's really important, and for other cultures too. So that's really important to me, and I thank you for that. Council of Fisos. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I'm speaking as someone who was labelled online um, as being an extreme green person, extremist green person, along with some other colleagues here. And um, and uh, we, I think we were accused of being extreme green because we it was about the UN Sustainability Develop Sustainable Development Goals. And um, I was curious to see that the posters who labelled, uh, who in, you know, did that kind of name calling were s assuming that um, that I and colleagues were see the car or the UN sees the car as an object of evil. And I just want to express my impatience with that kind of um, compartmentalised thinking. As far as I'm concerned, um, this this proposal is exciting. It's visionary. And it's about accessibility, not only to people who are physically challenged, but also, um, as as people have said, um, uh, in terms of mana whenua being, they've been constantly said in the last five years that I've been around um, these kind of circles, that they are sick of not being reflected in the heart of the city. And uh, so I just want to uh, applaud colleagues who have got this vision and are driving this thing forward and thank the staff. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Sort of. Um, thank you to the staff. Um, and that's at a whole lot of levels of staff. And I appreciate you two guys are leading this. But I think um, what I really like about this is the synergy with all of the other strategies that we've got. and. The fact that we've got the 2GP providing for inner city living in this area now on the first floor. Um, timing's everything. A few years ago, this wouldn't have been necessarily the right thing to do. It's certainly the right thing to do right now. Um, I think the, the people who are going to vote against this, I just don't know how you could dig up a street and just leave it with nothing. I just don't know what the other options are. Um, it would just look awful. It would, you know, Black ash Asphalt really isn't the way to do this. But um, I... It's the submissions that we've had. This isn't our project. This is reflecting what has been submitted on time and time again for a number of years. And we've had a lot of people saying, please do something. And they are sometimes shop owners too. There are also people who want to use this space as public realm space. This street isn't actually owned by the shop owners. It's owned by the city of Dunedin and its residents to use in a whole lot of different ways that until you provide for it, won't happen. You know, it's neat to see the street closed off when people have um, parades and things on it, but how else can it be used if we empower them? And I'm really excited by the idea of short festivals or actually in Bendigo, which I did go to as well, um, having street films, just an area where they put a screen up on one of these street things and had a film about biking. You know, it's, it's random stuff that might happen. I'm, I'm really excited by that. Um, it's a consultation that's in the quality of the consultation that's been fantastic and that isn't easy to, easily done um, and it will never be enough for some people but well done and I, I find it also really odd that people who may or may not have shares in malls um, could be anti this sort of development because in effect this is what we're doing as an outside mall um, the success of malls which have ruined many high streets um, and, or malls going into suburbs and ruining high streets in the many cities, this is our chance to give that <coughs> flavour um, in a street. What's even more important, and I just asked about the trials, if I reflect on the biggest area to be closed off and pedestrianised in Dunedin and reflect how successful that has been around the university campus with some investment into art and sense of place, I'm really excited to think there's 20,000 people who get it, um, more than 20,000, because of all the staff as well, these guys are going to get this even more when it happens in the street. And uh, um, that really excites me, that we know how to, how to use the space in a different way. So I'll definitely be supporting it. Councillor the Lord. <coughs> yeah, look, I, um, I guess I try and sit in most places and look at both sides of the equation. I, I've got an 18-year-old son that told me, Dad, the best thing you can do on councillors pedestrianise and close off the bit of George Street in front of the Meridian Mall and make it totally pedestrian. I, I realise this is a compromise. I, um, 
I don't have an agenda to do this or to not do it. I, I just think you make decisions on the day. But um, like Councillor Stebman, I travel overseas a bit and I love walking around, you know, Darling Harbour and parts of Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane where it's all very nice and pedestrianised. I've, I've been to America and I like the same aspects, but the difference is when I'm in America, I'm on a holiday and I'm sitting there and, and I'm shopping and enjoying it. Uh, I like sitting down and trying all the different cafes and stuff. Um, there's people that come in here on cruise ships and I'm sure they're going to love this. Um, there's people that are working here and it's going to affect them a bit. But I, I found, you know, from when I grew up as a boy in Omru and, you know, you'd walk to the hardware shop and get a pound of nails if you needed them or all bits and pieces. Nowadays, nowadays you do actually go to purpose-built places like Bunnings and Modatine and it suits me well in the car parks and I wouldn't try and come to the main street and look to buy nails or hinges or the sort of things that you used to buy. So I'm very aware that retail has changed dramatically. Um, for me now, I specifically use places like Noel Lemons, like uh, Rebel Sport, like Briscoe's for that sort of shopping and if I come to the main street, I'm looking for a shirt or a somewhere to go and meet someone to have a have a meal or a coffee. So, um, look, I can support this. Um, I'll be absolutely honest, I think we could have gone further, but um, I know that would have upset people more and people will think I'm a dinosaur for voting against the sustainable de development goals and they'll think I'm a, a turncoat for supporting this, but the reality of it is I think, I think we could have been a lot more um, progressive. Um, it's better than... Uh, that's no... Um, that's no condemnation of staff. I think you're working around and you're coming up with solutions. And um, yep, I like the green. I think green's pretty important, and um, we need to see we need to see plants and the best the best areas that I see. That's what you see. So um, yeah, I can support this. And yep, no problems. Thank you. I just add one uh, one brief comment. I think there's an element to this that hasn't been traversed during this discussion. Uh, <laughs> that hasn't existed in any of the previous um, discussions about the configuration of the main street, and that's the extension north as far as Albany. I think that's particularly important because it is an unusual space because of the one-sidedness of it in terms of the retail, but it's also a space that's got that critical mass of food and, and entertainment-related activities that we all know about if we know where the best breakfast is. But more importantly, or as importantly, it's one of the two key links to the campus. And I think, uh, as councillors are aware, the whole 60 million for the city is not being spent on this project, but there is an additional 20 million uh, that's been uh, referred to in discussions earlier today for the tertiary streets. And combined with this work, we have the most amazing capacity uh, to reinforce those links with our biggest business and make the campus and the city uh, even more closely linked for our mutual benefit. This is our shop window. It's not, as Councillor Wilson said, not just the shop window for the retailers who happen to be there at the moment. We're talking about spending tens of millions of dollars to make that shop window nicer, more comfortable and more attractive. And I don't think anyone who consults any history of what has happened with successful uh, shopping centres will have any doubt that this will be other than a resounding success. There is going to be disruption, of course. The roads are being dug up. And it will be a challenge for our staff to manage that with the minimum amount of disruption. I don't know whether that can be achieved by working through the night or not. We will see. Uh, but it will be done block by block in an incremental way, and what we will have when we get to the end of these projects uh, will be an even better Main Street than the one that currently exists and an even better city. Your right of reply, Councillor Newell. No, th no thanks. It's all been uh, transverse. <coughs> I'll put it and we'll put the motion by division. The motion is to endorse, the Council endorses the preliminary, preliminary design for the George Street Central City Plan Project and notes the activity plan being developed by staff to encourage activation of George Street prior to and during the construction period. Uh, a division, please, Lauren. Councillor Elder? Yes. Councillor Gary? Aye. Councillor Hall? Aye. Councillor Hawkins? Aye. Councillor Lofiso? Aye. 
Councillor Lord? Aye. Councillor O'Malley? Aye. Councillor Newell? Aye. Councillor Stephen? Aye. Councillor Vandivis? No. Councillor Wiley? Yes. Councillor Wilson? Aye. Councillor Benson Pope? Aye. Carried 12 votes to one. Thank you very much. Uh, that is the final item. Are there any matters for consideration by the Chair, Councillor Wilson? I'd, I'd just like to know where the uh, review of the commercial use of footpaths, because in relation to this space and how it may be used, there is some need for shop owners to understand that. And it would be very timely if we had an update on that sometime. All right. Ms. Ms. Graham is making a note as we speak. Councillor Wiley. Uh, yes, I'm looking for um, an update on the timeline around the exchange area. Since we've just talked about George Street, um, concern around the slumping in the court, courtyard area and increasing activity, obviously, with uh, more activity moving into the area. We'll get you some information on that. Councillor Elder? Um, just um, with the bikes, um, have we got enough bike cracks? for people if they want to bike into town? Uh, well, that's a matter that you can lodge with the design team. I think they probably heard that. We'll make sure that's the case. OK, thank you. And we can get you numbers on the ones we know we have. OK, yeah. All right, there being no further business, I'll close the meeting. Um, five minutes long enough before... They'll take ten, ten, to ten minutes to clear the cameras before we reconvene for council. <laughs>